We're going to be talking about microevolution versus macroevolution, or how kinds bring forth, as the biblical people like to refer to it. Okay, even the most die-hard stalwart of creationists will usually say that microevolution is accepted, but macroevolution is not. When asked exactly what microevolution is, frequently the example given is the idea of dogs becoming different breeds of dogs, but they're still dogs. If we trace back domestic dogs, we find their roots with the wolf. But according to creationists, the wolf is still a kind of a dog, so it still works. What the creationists don't seem to understand is that you cannot have a microevolution setup without a macroevolution setup, as they like to put it. For example, they agree that wolves can become dogs because they're just types of dogs, and that dogs can become different breeds of dogs. The number of breeds of dogs is outstanding. It's amazing how many there are. Just the ones registered with the American Kennel Club, there are over 150 different breeds registered. And this isn't anywhere close to all of the breeds out there. It may not even be half of the breeds of dogs out there. But, according to creationists, they're all still dogs. It doesn't matter how huge the changes can be. For example, this picture. They're still dogs. And to the creationists, that's still the same kind, so it's still acceptable. So far, all we've seen is samples of microevolution. These are all still canines. The wolf breaks into different types of dogs. The dogs break into the chihuahuas, etc., etc. The chihuahuas break into the long-haired and short-haired varieties. A minor change, but still another change in the steps. In the beginning of life, there were the single-cell organisms. The archaea, the prokaryotes, the eukaryotes. The eukaryotes are the complicated cells with all of the internal workings, the mitochondria, the Golgi apparatus, the nucleus, etc., etc., etc. But all of them have one thing in common. They are single cellular. Over countless generations, the cells of the eukaryote family divided into animal cells and plant cells. Plant cells having walls and being able to photosynthesize for food. Animal cells having locomotion. But, despite this small microevolutionary change, they were both still eukaryotic cells. The next split in the direction that we're going to be following is between single-celled and multi-celled. Single-celled, such as the amoeba, continued on on their own while some joined together in colonies called Grex, which is basically just a multicellular unit, and worked together. We will be following the multicelled side next, but it is still an animal cell. And those animal cells are still eukaryotes. Now, once the animal cells had formed colonies and become multicellular, the next microevolutionary step was simply that some developed tissue. Some did not. But even if they had tissue, or rather they didn't have tissue, they were still animals, and they were still eukaryotic cells. The tissue-bearing animals divided into ones that were non-bilateral and ones who adapted a bilateral symmetry. But whether they were symmetrical or not symmetrical, they still had tissues, they were still multicellular, they were still animal cells, and they were still eukaryotic cells more microevolution at work, the bilateral animals, some developed a nervous system that included a spinal cord. Some did not. The ones that did have the spinal cord, which was the new microevolutionary twist, became known as chordata. The chordata, or spinal cord bearing ones, some developed the bones to protect that cord, the actual spine, the vertebrae, and got divided into vertebrates and invertebrates, the microevolutionary change of just adding a backbone. Okay, now the vertebrates. One side went on to eventually become fish. The other side had four feet and became known as tetrapods, literally meaning four-footed. The tetrapod vertebrates went on to develop eggs that some would have single membrane eggs, 
some would have layered membrane eggs, which is where shells come from. The ones that had the layered membranes around their uh, embryos would it then develop into some that were warm-blooded and internalized the birth process. These would later become the mammals. The ones that continued to lay the eggs would for the most part be the non-mammals. Within the mammals, the internalizing of the young during the fetal stage, some would develop placentas in order to nourish the young. Others would not. The ones that did not are the marsupials. The placenta mammals some developed the ability to grasp, some did not. Some of those that grasped were able to lose their sense of smell to an extent and replace it with a heightened sense of sight, color vision, primates. One of the distinguishing features is basically not being completely colorblind like most of the other animals, having three color vision, the primary colors. The primates continued on until some began to lose their tails to an extent. The tail bones are still there, but they've been internalized. These become known as the apes, while the others become known as the monkeys. Some of those great apes eventually developed a higher intelligence, the ability to use tools to a higher degree than any other primate. They became known as Homo sapien, humans. Now, just like the short-haired chihuahua is still a dog and is still a canine, is still a wolf, etc., etc., humans are the higher intelligent but still tailless, still primates with color vision, still grasping with their opposable thumbs, still placental bearing during the gestation of embryos, still mammals, still amniotic with the amniotic sac during um, pregnancy. Still tetrapods, four limbs, we just learned how to grasp with our front two. Still vertebrae, don't believe me? Talk to a chiropractor. Still bilateral, mostly symmetrical, not perfect, but mostly. Still tissue bearing with our muscles. Still multi-celled. Still animals still eukaryotic colonies of cells. We are every category that has led up to us, and this is just a summary of them. Every little modification, every little change through microevolution that has led to us being us is something we are still part of. But it is that last change, the heightened intelligence that allowed us to build cultures, that raised us to the heights of civilization with the Greek philosophers and the Renaissance artists, and lowered us to the depths of depravity with totalitarian governments and genocides. This is what makes us us, the ability to go beyond our physical limits, to use tools, to use concepts that other animals can't. Now, Creationists will admit to microevolution, to the individual little steps that lead through this process. But what they have a problem with, and what they straw man the arguments with, is picking two stages that are separated by several steps of microevolution and claiming one cannot directly become the other. Of course not. You have to go through the steps in between. Imagine for a moment that you showed me your family tree. And you explain that your great-grandfather sired your grandfather. And I say that makes sense. And you say your grandfather sired your father. And I say that makes sense. And you say your father sired you. And I agree that that makes sense. Then you say, so, this is my great-grandfather. And I say, no, that's impossible. And when looking at it, you go, but you agreed to every generation. And I reply, yes, but I didn't see your great-grandfather give birth to you, therefore your family tree does not make sense. As ridiculous as that argument is, it's exactly the kind of argument that's being made when people try to pull the microevolution is observed, macroevolution isn't argument. It's ridiculous.